Hi, I'm Mike Shea, author of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master and SlyFlourish.com. Today, we're going to go through the second chapter in Lost Mine of Fandelver. Lost Mine of Fandelver is the very popular 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons adventure available in the D&D starter set. In a previous video, we covered chapter 1 called Goblin Arrows, in which the characters went through a goblin, or got ambushed by goblins, went through a goblin lair, rescued an NPC, and dealt with a boss before they went back on the road and headed to, to, the, to the village of Phandalin. In chapter 2, the characters make it to the village of Phandalin, and we have a very different kind of D&D adventure than we had previously. Unlike that one, which was very straightforward and mostly a, a combat-focused and a situation-focused adventure, this is much more of characters exploring a town. There's definitely a few interesting things that happen in this town, and if we want, while there isn't a strong, while there, there's a very strong start in chapter one, there isn't necessarily a strong start in this one. We could start off by having a couple of the red brands, the 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 villains, the the gang members of this town, harass the characters. Maybe just a couple of bandits who sort of harass them on the way in, and we'll see how the characters react to it. One trick I really like to do is to throw just a couple of monsters at the characters that aren't necessarily ones you would want to just kill outright and see how the characters deal with them. In this case, if they're getting harassed by a couple of red brands, will the party kill them outright? Will they accept the abuse and kind of go around? Will they actually convince them to let them go? We don't really know. So we can find out. One of the, one of the hard parts about this particular chapter is that there's so much to do. There are so many places to go. There's probably a dozen different NPCs that the characters can interact with. And the players can just get per paralyzed by decisions. So it really helps once the characters arrive at, at Phandalin and they meet with uh, Sildar. And Sildar says, I'm going to go try to find my friend Gundren. I'm going to go to, I suggest we go to this inn and I'm going to go uh, find an old wizard friend of mine. That, you know, that's, that gives some, some, some focus. But another area is to look at the characters and say, okay, what do you, you know, what, what, what missions do you have, if any? And if they don't have any, then, then you can help focus them down on, on, on something that they can do. But if they do have some that are tied into their background, oh, in my background, I know this person, I'd like to go talk to them, then it can help to uh, uh, sort of outline that, make sure that it's clear that what the options are. When the players are faced with too many options, it can be paralyzing for everybody, and it can lead to a real soft D&D game, just one where you're not, no one's really sure what they're doing and people can get very bored pretty quickly. So instead, focusing them on, you probably want to talk to these, these three people can really help. Take a little bit of time to figure out which NPCs you want to introduce to the characters, which ones you want to highlight so that you, you can put in front of them. You may want to go to talk to these two or three people, and that way the characters don't get thrown in many different directions. There's another tricky bit with Chapter 2 that actually can be a, a, a lot of fun, too. And that's how Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 can really interweave into one, an, one another. It's not necessarily set that you will run all of Chapter 2, finish it, and then go to Chapter 3. The quests that the characters can get from various people all throughout Phandalin can lead them off out into the areas around Phandalin to deal with Cragmaw Castle, or to deal with the wizard that's out dealing with the undead, or the strange banshee, or going to the uh, Thunder Tree, the village that has the uh, green dragon in it. It's very possible that the characters will go off and handle those sorts of adventures before they will come back here and deal with the Red Brand hideout. And that's perfectly acceptable. If you, if you treat chapters two and three as though they are one big sandbox, and make sure you read both of them, then you can figure out how to interweave both of those chapters together. And it really turns into this nice, fun, not too wide, but not too narrow sandbox that the characters can explore however they want to explore it. You essentially are treating the Red Brand hideout in the same way that you are treating all of the other major locations that are in chapter three. Chapter four, however, when you're actually going to Wave Echo Cave, which is the climax of the adventure, that really comes at the end. So it's easier to think of chapter two and three as though they are intertwined together. One of the tricks with Fandelver, with this adventure overall, is that the villain actually has a couple of doppelgangers who work for him. In the adventure, these doppelgangers don't really come up until the characters go to Wave Echo Cave, but we can start dropping them in now. It's really interesting to have a couple of characters that are or a couple of NPCs that are sort of watching the characters, and when the characters try to figure out what they're about, they suddenly can't find them, or they keep changing their shape. Probably the, char the par characters aren't going to notice that they're changing their shape yet, but it's possible that they might run into an NPC twice, and each time the NPC doesn't realize that they met him the other time, because it turns out one of them was a doppelganger. So there's a couple of interesting ways to deal with doppelgangers, and you to bring them in while the characters are navigating through the town can be a lot of fun. So pay attention to those, pay attention to those doppelgangers. 
When the characters actually do make it into the red brand hideout, there's a couple of tips for running that effectively. One is you don't have to run with the exact monsters that are sitting in that dungeon. If you find that the characters are either having too easy a time going through things and that they really, you want to ramp it up, you can have some of the other red brand bandits sort of make their way in and maybe more of them are in a location than you thought. Or if things are getting really slow and tedious and the players are getting bored with fighting the same kind of guys over and over again, have a few of them go away. Have more opportunities to roleplay with them rather than to, to just simply fight them one after the other. One of the encounters here has a Nothic. That's that crazy single-eyed monster that's down in the, in the crevice. It's a lot more interesting to have that Nothic treated as an NPC and to have him negotiate with the characters than it is to necessarily fight him. It's possible it's going to turn into a fight anyway. That guy is really creepy. But it could also be a really fun NPC interaction. So when you're running that whole Red Brand hideout, you, you don't have to treat it as one big combat fest. You can really change things around, move the NPCs around, decide whether or not the characters get the jump on them or not. Again, it can be really interesting if the party of characters manages to get the drop on a couple of red brands who aren't prepared for them and then see how the, how the players are going to react to that. That can be very interesting. At the end of the adventure, you have a nice fight against an evil wizard who can protect himself with his magical staff. But again, maybe the characters get a drop on him and he's really easy to drop. It doesn't have to be this knockdown drag out fight every time. Instead, it can be if the, if the players play it smart and they figure out how to sneak up on him, they can hit him and knock him out and that's that's the end of that. The one thing I do is his staff, he has that, that staff of shielding. There's no reason for him to wait to use mage armor. He would probably use mage armor every time. So the idea that he has mage armor up already is fully reasonable. And the minute he has reactions, he's gonna start throwing up shield to uh, defend against enemy attacks. So that's something I would probably do just to make him a little bit harder. But again, if he happens to be sleeping in his bed or sitting at his desk writing love letters, whatever's going on, if the characters manage to get a drop on him, don't rob him of that opportunity. It can still be very cool for the characters to deal with that a certain way. So chapter two is a different kind of adventure. Again, it's very open-ended and it's going to be more challenging to run than chapter one was. If we help focus things down for our players so that they have options that they understand, that they know there's these four or five options. If we interweave chapter two and chapter three together so the players can, the characters can leave Phandalin, come back, leave again, come back, and then finally figure out that they have to deal with the red brands and then deal with the red brands. All of that can work however we want to work, however we want to work it. It's a fantastic adventure. It's a really interesting, this, this middle part is really what a, a wider D&D game looks like, and it can be a whole lot of fun. So I hope you found these tips useful. If you did, please check out my book, uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, and I will see you for the next video when we'll talk in depth about chapter three.